Hello guys, this is Reza with another Unreal Engine tutorial. Layers provide the capability to efficiently select and control the visibility of actors within your level. Opting for layers over object IDs facilitate a rapid decluttering of your scene, presenting only the relevant actors, especially when you incorporate motion blur or depth of field. This functionality becomes indispensable when you bring layers into your renders using Path Tracer, a process that we will delve into extensively in this tutorial. In addition, I will demonstrate the seamless compositing workflow of these layers inside Foundry Nuke, unlocking the capabilities of this exceptional tool. So without any further ado, let's get started. <music> Here I am inside Unreal Engine. I've already gone ahead and set my camera carefully. So I have an element in the near ground and maybe my main actor in the mid ground or background. Now the power of layers come to play when you wish to decompose the scene for any trickeries in your compositing, whether if it's object replacing or color correcting and grading, this method can be extremely useful. A while ago, we did a video on object IDs and explained how you can use crypto mats inside Nuke to isolate an object, change the color of it, so on and so forth. While this method is very solid, it doesn't allow for incorporating depth of field and motion blur. And you can see in the near ground, we have actually a severe motion blur to deal with. That would be a prime example on when to use layers. Now, first things first, where to find the layer panel? It's inside window and we have layers. It adds a panel to the UI and right now it's empty. You have to nominate your actor that you would like to separate from the scene and put that into the layers panel. You have two ways of doing this. First is to right click, create an empty layer. And usually when you create a layer, you have the name layer plus a number. And as you add layers, it just adds to that number. And I can select it, press delete to delete it or right click to rename it. To add to the layer, select an actor, select the layer, right click on the layer, add selected actor in selected layer. And now my actor has been added to this layer. And if you wish to test, you just toggle the visibility and you can see the visibility of this actor is now controlled by this layer. Another way of doing this is not to have any layer at all and select your actor and right click add selected actor to new layer and the same thing happens. In this case, I'm going to call that staircase. And again, if I toggle the visibility on and off, you can see the visibility now gets controlled by this layer. The good thing about using layers is an actor can be in as many layers as you want. This might be a very useful thing when you have different sets of actors that fall under overlapping layers. Now we understand how layers work. Let's see with path tracer on how we can use layers in rendering because we are separating those actors from the main level for a reason to be able to decompose our scene and composite things back inside your preferred compositing application. And that's where the level sequencer comes to play. You can see I have a Cine camera actor ready to go. And once that's done and ready, I can go into render this movie and it opens the render movie queue. You can see the sequence has been selected successfully. Always check for the right sequence if you have multiple level sequence in your scene and I'm gonna go ahead and open its settings. 
And this is a typical structure you get. JPEG, deferred rendering for lumen and output. The only change I made in here is, I believe, in the frames where I said, use custom playback range. I'm going to only render one frame since I have no animation. That will be enough for the demonstration. But when you use layers in conjunction with path tracing, the rules of the game will change ever so slightly. So let's talk about those. The first rule is not to use JPEG. We are going to use EXR 16-bit instead. Every time you use EXR sequence, make sure that multi-layer is enabled. No need to change the compression or switch it to none because it just adds to your file size and reward you with barely noticeable increase in quality. The second one that we are going to use is anti-aliasing, which is actually quite important. We have special sample count, which is in charge of the actual denoising. So I'm going to crank this up to 16 and Unreal Engine says, all right, you have a sort of a different value for your project and you're increasing it. We say, that's fine override the default to the new value that I set and temporal sample count while that can be useful increasing it too high will create an artifact in your final render so I'm just going to ever so slightly bump it up now the reason that I always put anti-aliasing first is because I'm using path tracer and that's the next node that I'm going to add path tracer and reference motion blur and accumulate include alpha always look into anti-aliasing for further tweaks i do not have any motion blur but i would like to extract an element with its alpha to foundry nuke so i need to have accumulator includes alpha now here's the real beauty comes because in object IDs videos I had to separate world pass and motion vector separately. I had to bring them in and include that into my script which was an extra steps in my workflow and that might complicate things. With this new method I don't need any of them. So I can comfortably collapse that and move on to stencil clip layers. Now let's talk about stencil clip layers and why they're so powerful. First things first, this option allows for layered rendering of your sequence based on the objects within your layer. So it's really easy to nominate set of actors and say, render this, don't render this. Very similar to render layering system in other DCCs like Autodesk Maya. The other benefit of using stencil clip is this allows for shadow casting objects to cast shadows onto other actors and layers, which is fantastic. And the third benefit is once rendered to stencil buffer, a post-production effects is also applied to this layer. And that's why we say if you have any motion blur or depth of field, you will be safe. The way that you assign this layer to the stencil clip layer is fairly straightforward. It says, well, do you have any actor layer? In our case, we have one. So I'm just going to click on this plus to add an element. And inside index, I'm just going to select my only existing layer. If you ever want to tweak this very layer, you can click on this arrow down delete the layer, duplicate the layer, or insert an actor into this existing layer. I also would like to bring high resolution in there. No tweaks, the default works best. And one very important node that you need to bring because the plan is to use a linear workflow inside your preferred compositing application is to use color input. And color input says, well, if you leave disabled tone curve, you kind of need to have a color IO in place. We would like to bring in linear EXR images into Nuke and Nuke loves linear workflow. So for that matter, I always enable this option to disable tone curve 
for this sequence. One last change I would like to make is within the path tracer. You may have noticed that I extracted that layer, put that layer into my stencil clip layer, and we are ready to go. The result is just going to be the staircase. Well, what about the background? Do I need to have another layer for the background? The answer is no. You actually go ahead and add default layer and enable it. And it puts the rest of your scene and your level into that default layer and calls it default layer. So you don't really need to have multiple layers unless you intentionally would like to isolate objects, decompose it, extract it, and tweak it in post. So with that said, our job is done. Deferred rendering is now off and we are ready to go. I'm going to go accept and I'm going to render locally. Of course, if you have form, you can render remotely. I'm going to go with render local and it is going to open up render preview, goes through all the passes and gives me a single EXR. See you in the next chapter when I bring the output into Nuke and we composite things back together. Here I am inside Foundry Nuke. Let's drag and drop our sequence, in this case a single frame. And there we have our image. If I double click, you can see the input transform is set to linear. That's why we used color output in the settings inside Unreal Engine. Now, just like object IDs and Unreal Reader videos that I covered in the past on this channel, we are going to use the shuffle node in order to extract these layers. So the layers are already here. The default layer has got only the background and the staircase, the name of the layer that we created inside Unreal is a separate layer now with correct alpha channel. So I'm going to just press tab and type in shuffle. We need one shuffle node for the default layer. I'm going to call that background and I'm going to copy and paste another of these shuffle nodes. And this one is going to be near ground. And of course, in the near ground, we are going to switch to path tracer staircase. And in this one, it stays as default. Now to connect the two, all I need to do is just to drop in a merge node. So I'm going to detach the view, press M, connect the viewer to the merge. One goes to the background, the other one goes to the near ground. The operation of the merge node has to be plus. So that's the only thing you need to be careful about. If you leave that to over, I'm sure you guys can see if I zoom in the difference between over and plus, it leaves a halo trace behind, which is not quite pleasing to the eye. Now, from this point onward, you can actually keep going with extracting layers. For example, let's say you have another two layers that you would like to work with. Again, using Merge Plus, you're merging these two. And with another Merge Plus, you go and connect this one to this one and you keep going. Obviously, in this case, that is not the case. Another tip is when you want to color grade either of them, you have to unpremalt and premalt. So, uh, for example, in the near ground pass or layer in this case, if I want to color correct it, I can go unpremalt to reveal the edges and that kind of removes the anti-aliasing. And then you can drop in your grade node or hue shift or what have you. And after that, you need to pre mult it again. And only then the whole system is going to work as intended. In your grade, you can go in there and 
ever so slightly change the color. Let's say I'm going to go a little bit warm on this. If I select all of these guys, press D on it, before, after, before, after. And if I look at the merge node, you can see the effect that I'm producing in color grading using the what I call the sandwich on pre-mold, pre-mold and your grading node right in the middle. It can be color correct, it can be hue shift, it can be grade, so on and so forth. And then you go in there, you drop in a right node using W on the keyboard and you export out your end result. That should do the trick. Uh, I hope you found this video useful. Make sure to follow me on X, Reddit and Instagram to know about all the upcoming projects that are in the works and until the next video see you guys later